Good evening. I'm Ava Klingenberg. Welcome to the International Photography Hall of Fame Digital Happy Hour with Richard Springler on street photography. We invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy the art of photography with us tonight. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to highlight the image behind me from the IPHF collection. In honor of Black History Month and the monumental strides in Duck D. Gordon Parks made in photography, we are show showcasing his image, model wearing nursemaid's kerchief, taken in 1952. And on digital happy hour, Richard Sprangler is a professional commercial photographer since 1984. He transitioned into his current specialty of architectural photography in 2000, and he is also a curator with the International Photography Hall of Fame. Tonight, he will be sharing his concepts, techniques, and images of street photography from around the world. We ask that you keep your computers muted until Q&A at the end of the presentation, and a brief survey will be sent out to all attendees tonight following the presentation. We invite you to suggest other topics uh, to include for digital happy hours in the future. All right, and thank you so much for being here. And now, Richard Springler on street photography. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me tonight. Um, I'm normally associated with architectural photography and uh, landscape photography, but in the last 10 years, I've done a lot of international traveling and I've fallen in love with street photography. I'd like to share with you uh, a lot of images, but some techniques and concepts that I've learned along the way. Uh, so let's jump right into it here. Um, this is the Mardi Gras in New Orleans. And one of the first things I had to unlearn as an architectural photographer is the uh, having to level the camera all the time. I actually found out that in many instances, making the camera crooked will help an image. In this case, these two women are standing straight up and down, but it was a static composition in general straight verticals and straight horizontals in a photograph are static. And as soon as you tilt the camera, you create diagonals out of those lines and the image becomes much more interesting. So uh, whenever I come close to people, I, I typically try to tilt the camera and see, and see what happens. This is the Mardi Gras down in New Orleans. And whenever I see someone with an umbrella or a parasol, I know that there's a potential photograph waiting. Um, what the umbrella does for you is it gives you an automatic portrait background. It eliminates everything in the background and the umbrella and the ribbing is interesting in itself. Um, it's hard to notice, but I have tilted the camera slightly. She's actually standing straight and her eyes would be straight parallel across the, the plane. But slightly tilting the camera makes this a much uh, more interesting photograph. Here's another parasol. Uh, I got down low to shoot this and I love the light on the man's face. This is the day of the dead celebrations in Oaxaca, Mexico. And again, here's a parasol and um, Mexico is the friendliest country I have ever been in. Uh, everybody is just friendly. They're, they're, they wanna talk to you. And uh, I've got this photograph in my living room because it personifies uh, what I feel about the city of the, the country of Mexico. Again, I tilted the camera for this. This is the Mardi Gras down in New Orleans. And when I do night photography, a lot of times I'll do a technique called rear curtain flash synchronization. And what that means is that you set your shutter speed either on manual or shutter priority to one or two seconds and go into your menu and pick rear curtain flash synchronization. And what happens is you have a long exposure of a second where you can blur the camera. You can actually move the camera to create blurs and at the end of the one or two seconds, the flash goes off. So you have a combination of frozen image and blurred image. And here's some examples of the Mardi Gras down there. There's a float on the left here at night and people are trying to uh, collect the beads that are, are thrown out. Another float at night. It, it makes for a, a very beautiful image at times. This one, I did not look through the camera. I was holding the point and shoot straight in front of me and the camera's actually turned over at 45 degrees, but, but, I, but I love the image. This is San Miguel, San Miguel de Allende, Mexico. It's a town in the, high, the coastal highlands of Mexico, north of Mexico City. And uh, we fell in love with the town. It's got one of the biggest collections of uh, 
colonial architecture surviving in Latin America. And there's street festivals almost twice, about twice a week, there's a festival going on in the streets. And this is one of the festivals and I found it's much more interesting to shoot the people watching the festival than the festival itself. This photograph represents a concept called the default network in your brain, where the thousands of photographs you've taken, you've built up an instinct of how to make a photograph. And when you look through the camera, you instinctually know how to compose a picture. You, you frame the picture, you level the camera, you focus, you get everything looking normal like you normally do. But what not looking through the camera does is it enables you to short circuit that whole process and give you an image that you would never have made in, in before. And for, this is a great example. Uh, if I would have looked through the camera, I would have framed this a lot lower. Um, but not looking through the camera included all these things, all these things at the top. And it's, it's a really interesting photograph. It's a, it's, it makes kind of a, a loose composition, I'd like to say. Also on the streets, I always look for mirrors. I watch a lot of BBC productions on PBS and on Amazon Prime. And it's really fascinating to watch what the um, British cinema photographers are doing with mirrors. Uh, it creates the double images and uh, a surreal effect at times. And when I saw this image with the, uh, with the mirror, I knew there was something here. Um, what I enjoy about this image is that this American couple here are, are talking to this boy down here, he's selling them candy. And beneath them is a woman who's talking to somebody outside the picture. And up here is somebody in the, in the mirror. The person she's talking to is the person in the mirror. So real successful photographs many times have multiple things going on. In this case, we have, we have three people here with the candy, We've got the woman at the bottom and you got the woman in the mirror here. So, uh, the more things you can get going in one photograph, the, the more interesting it will be. This is a, uh, a, a technique I used on this one is multiple imagery. I, I saw this scene and I recognized the potential for a really good photograph. And I just wanted to get people walking through the picture that would, would liven up the picture and fill up the space. And I, I couldn't get it all at once. So I've learned the technique of holding the camera real still and just making multiple exposures. And this is what happens. Let me move the layer palette over here. Here is the first exposure. And I thought, well, maybe I can add these people. Boom, there we go. And then I added another exposure right there. And now I filled up the picture and it's, it's, a, it's a, a interesting photograph, I think. The rest of these layers are things I normally do in Photoshop. Here's an overlay layer where I do burning and dodging. Um, call this the, the gospel according to Ansel Adams. He always burned in his corners and his edges. And you can see here, I'll click this off and on. You can see my edges and my corners go darker. And it always makes the photograph look better. And then there's some curves and uh, for contrast and brightness. One of the things I learned in commercial photography is that your eye goes to the brightest thing in the picture. And if you don't want your eye to go there, you might want to darken it. In this case, look at the uh, windshield and the street down there. And I darkened it with this layer. And this is how you do it. If you're not familiar with Photoshop, there's a, a phenomenon called layer masks. And this allows that to happen right there. Down here with the people, here's the layer masks for those people. Here's the layer mask for those people. There's the beginning and there's the end. Here's another example of the same technique. Uh, I saw the scene and I recognized the potential for it. Um, I couldn't get everybody in the picture at the same time. So this is, a, this is how it started out. And I did multiple exposures and, and with layer mask, I was able to add the things in. Here we go. This is actually the same bird that was walking forward. There's someone to the left, another person right there, different group of people in the, in the middle. Then the last one is a, a little girl right there. Now we've got a really interesting photograph and then the other layers are just finishing off of the piece. Here I've darkened the sidewalk on the far left. So this is a way to get a, a photograph peopled with people even though that really wasn't that way in, in real life. 
I prefer to get it all in, in one exposure, but when that's impossible, you've got this option. Um, I heard a photographer call this technique um, freeing photography from the tyranny of the 1 60th of a second, meaning that you're not limited to just one exposure. This was a real interesting uh, photograph to make. This is the uh, artist market in San Miguel de Allende. And I saw this postcard here, or a, a small print of a handless Jesus behind bars. And it was just so bizarre that I had to photograph it. But this was the problem that I faced. When you're that close to something in the foreground, you cannot get everything in focus. So I thought, how, how can I get this photograph? And I remembered that you can point the camera off to the left press the shutter release button down to focus and then return the camera to where it was. So doing that, I was able to focus the background and drop that in as a layer. I did, I did several other things. And there's the finished photograph. Again, for this, here is the layer mask. It's, it's a hard edge selection. Sometimes I, I like to use a fuzzy brush when you can get away with it, but when you can't, uh, you have to make a, a pretty exacting selection to get a hard edge here in this mask. This is a fun one. Um, Gary Winogrand was uh, influenced by a photograph by Eugene Atche in Paris, where there was a group of people on the street all looking at something. In this case, it was, uh, they're looking up in the air at a solar eclipse and uh, when I saw this scene, I, I thought of that. And I thought a, a picture of everybody looking at something. And, and you know, this is one of the, the most joyful photographs I've ever taken. And it was really a funny scenario going on. This woman in the middle had, uh, in pink, she has this little electrical device with a battery in it. There's wires coming off of it with two metal handles. And you get a group of people together holding hands. You give one handle to one person on the end, the other handle to the other person on the far end. And she turns up the rheostat and electric current goes to the entire line of people. <laughs> she, she keeps turning it up until everybody starts laughing and giggling. One girl screamed and the audience was, was just going into hysterics. This, this was really a fun thing to photograph. Another technique I use is um, rent a cab for an hour and drive around town. Um, I don't uh, rent cars when I'm in Mexico. The streets are too congested. It's, it's too hard to get around. So the cabs are, are cheap. You can, you can get a cab to take you down, two people downtown for $2. So I rented a cab for an hour and just drove around. And I even enjoy having part of the cab in the photograph as a framing device. Here's the, my, my first body of street photographs were made in Italy. I went there 10 years ago with my daughter when she graduated from high school. This is Florence. And I used a framing device of this motorcycle in the foreground. Um, the great master of street photography, Henry Cartier, very son, he coined the term the decisive moment. And that referred to the moment when everything is perfect, when people are in the right spot. And the, the decisive moment for this photograph was the man on a cell phone here standing or walking right in front of the building. Um, this is a multiple image photograph, several photographs, several images were for the different people in the distance. I believe this is Venice and I like to look into the windows of shops and you get a double image. You get the inside of the shop and you get the reflection of the street on the outside and it makes a very surrealist, surrealistic looking image. Um, photographers have been doing this for since the inception of photography almost. Etche made a whole bunch of surrealistic images in Paris in the 1920s. What I enjoy about this is you can see the inside, you can see the wall up here, you can see this poster of people and the mannequins. This mannequin arm comes down and touches the top of this man's head in the street and another arm of the other mannequin, the hand touches this woman right on her shoulder. It's a composite photograph put together, but I did catch these people at the right moment. I saw the hand on top. Uh, he, he just comes from a separate exposure along with his shadow. Another mannequin shot, looking, in, looking into the, uh, 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 a store. And what's interesting is that the bright part of the mannequins doesn't show a double image, it washes out. 
the darker parts, the images show up. So you have a person right in this dark purple shirt right here. Here's my daughter. Here's a scene in Florence where the, the dramatic shadow, uh, I knew it was an inevitable photograph and I wanted a person right there. Um, the street was deserted at that, at that time. And finally I asked my daughter to walk into the picture and being an artist, she, would, she made a very good model for me. And I knew I wanted to catch her there and that's where I tripped the shutter, but I didn't realize what was going on with her shadow. Watch her shadow line merge with the shadow of the pole that goes up into the stop sign and sign right here. This is in Florence, uh, a, a, a street uh, fair uh, flea market. Uh, what I enjoy about this is the, I waited for the expression on this woman in the foreground and, the, and her hand like that. And then I waited for different people to walk through the scene. And so the people in, this, in the distance are separate exposures along with their shadows. And you don't notice it at first. You see the bright people out here, then you notice the woman with her hand you follow this red dress up the top and oh my goodness, there's four buttocks hanging up in the air right here. So you don't see it right off the bat, but it's, it's really funny when you do see it. So there's multiple things going on in this photograph. You have the foreground with this woman here, then you have the, the things going on in the distance and then everything on the perimeter of the photograph. This is in Florence and this kind of shows a, a sad phenomenon. This, this is a woman beggar on the street here and they're typically very old women, and they will bend over onto the street like this for hours, not moving. And they have a, a little tray out there for, for tips, and it's kind of sad to watch people walk around them. Sometimes when it's real busy, they'll step over them, but not give them any money. Um, I wanted to catch the people at the right time. This is all one exposure. And some of the things that happen in, in photography, you just can't explain, like how the fender of this truck or the, the car here is perfectly centered in the ladder. Um, I was focusing on the man. I don't think I consciously saw that, but um, who knows? Um, what I do know is accident, accidents like this will happen more often when you're focusing and concentrating. When, I, when I'm on the street, I'm concentrating really hard. And uh, I have about a limit of about two and a half hours of photography before it just starts to wear you out. And then I'll I'll do this in the morning, then I'll go have lunch, I'll lay down, take a rest, go out in the afternoon for two and a half, three hours, in the same scenario, then do it at night. But the, the, more, the more you're out there, the more you shoot, uh, the more times you'll have happy accidents like this. This is another one. Uh, this is in, in, in uh, Venice, I believe. I, I saw this as an architectural shot with the graphic shapes and the high contrast, and I was just hoping somebody would walk into the photograph and I could see them coming out of the corner of my eye. And when he walked into the picture there, I tripped the shutter. And this is another happy accident. Look at the line, the white line here going right up next to his shirt. And there was a sliver of white right next to his shirt right there that he didn't, he, he didn't cover. What the percentage of likelihood that that could happen is so incredibly small that it's, it, it's amazing. But again, the more you shoot, the more it happens. Another thing I do on the street is to get inside the, sh the shops and, and shoot out into the street. You get interesting scenes like this. This is obviously in, in Venice. And um, I was hoping to get a, a, a two gondolas, one gondola at least, but fortunately I, I got two and I waited until it was the best composition this is a good example of what happens with wide angle lenses. Is I, I'm using my point and shoot and I've, I've zoomed it to the widest angle and you'll get a, a big change in scale. We have the foreground person and these little, the persons in the distance turn into these tiny people. And it's, it's all a, uh, it's principled with the wide angle lenses and it can make some interesting photographs. This is in Venice. The public transportation in Venice is large boats. Um, middle of the day, they get real crowded. About 80 people can pack onto these things. So I've got my point and shoot up against my chest by my sternum and I've got somebody six inches in front of me here on the bottom left. But I was able to, to get this photograph of what is going on with these gentlemen, this, this funny scenario. Um, what's interesting is if you look up at the roof of the boat, you can see how the boat is tilted. But take your hand and block the top of the boat 
and just look at the people. It doesn't look like it's a tilted photograph at all. So what generally happens when you tilt the, the camera like this is one or two things will be straight up in the picture, like, like this man on the left and the man right here in the middle. And when you have something that's straight in a photograph that's been tilted, it gives a sense of normalcy to it. You don't notice the tilt. This is on one of the boats again, and it was a hot August day, and I thought this was just this is such a sweet scene with the man and his wife, as she's wiping the sweat off of his forehead, and it's contrasted by the expression on the face of the woman behind him. And then I, I like the distribution of, of the, the faces in this picture. This is in Venice at night. Uh, gelato, that's the Italian word for, for ice cream, is real big. Everyone buys gelato, especially in the summer. So here's a photograph taken at dusk and I'm in the shop looking out and there's, there's two separate things going on. There's a group of three people here with their ice cream cones. One woman has the cone in her mouth. This guy's just about to put it in his mouth and this guy's looking at it. And then the separate scenario is the mother and her daughter looking at the chocolates in, on the shelf. So again, the more things you can get going on at once, the stronger the photograph. This is a complete night in, in Venice. Um, what I finally discovered and settled on for, uh, for my equipment for doing street photography is my point and shoot. I, I tried using my D800 digital 35 millimeter and the lenses aren't fast enough to get good photography in, in the middle of the night, even if uh, you raise your ISO. Um, I use my point and shoot and I put it on automatic and it does all the thinking for me. It raises the ISO and you can just shoot away in the middle of the, of middle of the night. Um, Lightroom and or uh, Photo Raw in Photoshop is a, does an incredible job with noise. So you can get the noise out of these photographs and uh, it, it makes night photography a lot easier. And again, uh, the point and shoot is my primary instrument when I do photography now. Um, I took a photograph in, in Venice with the point and shoot, made a 16 by 20 print of it. And it was as sharp as a four by five enlargement. So um, I, I, try your try your thirty five millimeter, but uh, I think you'll dis, you'll discover that a point and shoot or even the cell phone works wonders. This is Ireland, and when I photograph children, I, I make it a point to get down low at their level to look into them instead of looking down, and it makes it a much for a much more interesting photograph. This is St. Patrick's Day parade in the city of Killarney. Same parade and I'm down low, I'm, I'm kneeling on the sidewalk and I, I love the light on, on this girl's face. And it, it, I, I like when photo, people aren't looking into the camera, um, when they look somewhere else, it's very, very interesting. I saw this father and daughter and when I photograph people on the street, if I'm not doing it on the sly, I'll just approach them and I'll smile and I'll point to my camera and I'll point to them. And he nodded and said, sure. And, and that's all the communication that it takes. Um, so I, I, I did this photograph of him and I purposely tilted the camera. And the funny thing is, it is here's the father and his daughter and the word stud right on the top. It's kind of hilarious. Um, it's actually a photography studio. This is in, the, uh, in Ireland again, and this is not looking through the camera. You know, so you short circuit the uh, default network. Um, it could, be, could have been an architectural photograph without the people. Look how these three windows are centered in between these three people. Um, and, and look how his nose just almost touches the, uh, the gutter right here. It's another one of those, those things that you can't explain in photography. I always thought the conver I didn't hear the conversation, but she looks pretty angry. And I always imagined he was saying, what do you mean, honey? I always drink a case of beer on St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> Here's using a reflection in the shop window. It uh, doubles the amount of people in the picture. Um, quite typically, I don't get these kinds of photographs in one exposure. I'll find the scene and I'll do a lot of exposures. You know, I'll just shoot a bunch and out of 15 or 20 uh, photographs, I'll pick out the best one. Here's kind of a chaotic scene. Uh, when you're on the street, there's an ebb and flow, things are, mo are moving. 
and you have to really focus and concentrate to catch it at right at the right moment. And, and this moment lasted about a second before the gap here in the middle closed up. What I really enjoy is a little boy down here in the bottom right, looking over his sunglasses right into the camera. And as you look around the photograph, you come to this mother with her arm and discover there's a little handicapped boy in a wheelchair right here. This is Mexico. This is in Oaxaca, Mexico. I found the scene and I knew that I wanted somebody in this corner and I just held the fort and shoot steady and, and waited for somebody to walk into the picture and shot it. Um, the great street photographers love to use the, the Leica camera. And the reason why is that the Leica has a viewfinder in the top left corner and they would look through the viewfinder with their right eye and that left their open left eye to watch the scene so that they would know when things are coming. They're not caught by surprise if somebody comes in the left side of the picture and they missed it. Um, I don't use a Leica, but when you're holding the point and shoot out in front of you, you can see the whole scene. Here's another architectural shot where I waited for somebody to, to walk into the picture. Um, I shot three photographs here. Uh, there's three positions that would work for this woman. This first one is on the left in the blue, right here, which was the best, and then her walking down the street on the left, and that, that wasn't as, as good. And here's one of those photographic mysteries. Um, the, the color scheme of the architecture is black and white and blue and brown, and look what the, the woman is wearing, black and white and blue, with that gorgeous skin tone that the natives have down in Mexico. Here's the exact same scenario. I saw the scene and waited for somebody to walk in. The color scheme of the mural on the wall it is black and yellow and gray, and the woman is wearing black and gray and yellow. Uh, it's just another one of those, those mysteries of photography. Again, the more you shoot, the more often it'll happen. This is a, a parking lot, a public parking lot in San Miguel de Allende. This was multiple exposures uh, stitched together in Photoshop with layer masks. I love the infant baby there in, in her arms. Um, this is a, a great example of like in the Venice shot with the gondolas, uh, the scale differences that happen with a wide angle lens. You know, the, the scale of the woman in the foreground and the people in the distance. Not, not all of it is just the wide angle lens. The, uh, the folks on the right are American, they're taller. And the gentleman in the distance here is, is a Mayan and they're, they're very short. He's only about probably five feet tall. So there's a, there's a kind of a scale thing going on here too that I enjoy. This is the decisive moment again, waiting for somebody to come through the door. This, this is all Mexico, all these photographs. San Miguel, Mexico, and this is all about the expressions on the two women on, on the right. Um, this is an example of where I think if you tilted the camera, it probably wouldn't work. Um, generally, the tilting works when you're closer in on things, but when you have a much wider view like this, I, I tend, tend to not do it. This was a street musician and he was extraordinary. Fantastic guitarist and a singer and a composer. And I did a number of photographs of him and this was the best. I came back to San Miguel the next year, hoping I would run into him and I did. I got more photographs of him, but this first one was, was the best. This one is just humorous. Um, one of the things I had to unlearn with street photography is uh, used to be a no-no to cut people's heads off, but uh, you can throw all the rules out the window and you can actually make a better photograph by, by chopping people off like this. The same in this photograph. This is all about her torso and the two shadows to the left. If I would have backed up or made the lens wider, uh, the photograph would have gotten too loose and wouldn't have worked as well. This is, I like to photograph people taking pictures of themselves. And this is the best one I've ever gotten. This is the largest group of people that I've gotten. Uh, you can see everybody's faces. Uh, that's what's so extraordinary about, extraordinary about it. I love the woman taking the picture and the way her eyes are turned backwards. Um, there's a great documentary on um, 
Gary Winogrand that was on PBS American Masters and you can see it on Amazon Prime. And a photographer was talking about one of Gary Winogrand's photographs on the street and he said, look at the dance of legs in this photograph and look at the bottom left of the photo. You see these legs, one, two, three, four, five. This is what I call the dance of legs. And um, legs become a very important part of the subject matter in, uh, in street photography and they can become very important. This is all one exposure. I, I was fortunate to catch everybody. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine people in the photograph, plus a donkey. And I was able to get everything in. I, I enjoy the cell phone here on the left with the reflection of the person taking the picture. Uh, it looks like this toddler isn't, it, he's ready for a nap. He's a little, he looks a little dazed. This one is interesting because if you take your hand and cover up the woman's head and, and hand, it looks like more clothes, on, blue clothes on the, on the rack. Take your hand away and you can see it's, it's a person. And I wanted someone to come there into the picture and I snapped it when she was there. But again, here's one of those photographic mysteries is she's got blue on, the, the color scheme fit the uh, photograph. And then right here at the top of the mannequin, there's a slight gap between the top of the head and that line there. I, did, I was not conscious of that when I took the photograph, but again, it's one of those mysteries. Love the color in this photograph. Um, again, I like it when people are in the photograph or looking at different, different directions. She's looking for a bus probably. He's looking straight into the camera and he's shielding his eye from the bright sun. This is in San Miguel Allende. And here again, we've got three people and one person is not looking into the camera and it makes it a much more interesting photograph. And this kind of encapsulates the feeling in Mexico. They're so friendly. Um, I don't think I could have made this photograph in St. Louis of a, of a, a mother and two kids. I would have gotten hostile stares, but uh, you don't get that in Mexico. This is just pure joy. She was somebody who was blowing bubbles for her and she was screaming at the top of her lungs. And again, I got down low. School children in a, in a street parade. I love all the faces. One of the things that happens with street photography quite often is, is the way you, I talked about cutting the heads off before, but quite often on the right and left edges of the frame, you'll cut people off. Look at, look at this little boy right here. You can just barely see his eye right there and his, his finger poking into his cheek. And that, I always find that interesting when people get sliced right on the edges. Love the girl looking the opposite direction, way over to the left. This was New Year's Eve in San Miguel. Um, I saw this toddler walking around in his stocking feet. It was cold, it was about 45 degrees. Um, some people were sitting on the sidewalk, so I just sat down right next to them and was able to get this photograph of him and the rest of the adults walking. And again, this is all about the dance of legs. I saw these two children coming towards me. It just started to rain and they're, they're running for cover from the rain. Um, I saw him coming and uh, I instinctually got down low on my knee and uh, was able to, to, to capture them as they came by. Um, and again, I like one person is looking up, the other one's looking forward. And, you know, I, I'm not sure if you would gather that it was necessarily raining if you didn't see this girl looking up like that. Here's what I took of a, a child on the street buying balloons. And this is a great example of almost a good photograph. I did not get down low at her level. I'm standing straight up and looking down at her. And just imagine if I would have gotten down low and looked up and seen all the balloons and the tall man at the top of the photograph. And so that's, that's the difference. I can't overemphasize that much. You know, get down low when you're shooting children. This is all one straight exposure and is a great example of the decisive moment. Um, this instant lasted for one second and it was gone. I've got this lady in the distance perfectly in between here and this woman on the edge it slit right in half I was just talking about people on the edge and her foot is in the air just about to step on the step right there so there's there's a moment where everything comes together there's a coffee shop where you can get coffee from the street but I like to go into the coffee shop and, and photograph people on the way out um, I did a whole bunch of photographs I probably took 15 or 20 photographs 
and this one was the best. Um, strange thing happens on the street when you're photographing. It's like the scenario when you pull up to a stop sign and you look at the car next to you though, and, and they had just turned to look at you and you see each other. Um, there's a so there's some kind of communication going on between people that's uh, not unlike birds or, or fish flying together in synchronization. But she's walking down the street and for some reason she had to turn and our eyes met and I was able to make the photograph. This is Carlos. He had a coffee shop right next to my hotel and I would get coffee every afternoon. Um, I was influenced by Paul Strand a, a lot. Um, both, both his, his architecture work, uh, his photographs in Mexico, but his portraits. He made some of the greatest portraits in the history of the medium. Uh, one of the things he would do in his photographs is he would use geometry. He loved circles. Uh, if you see some of his great photographs, the family in Luzera, uh, Italy, there's a bicycle wheel that he, I'm sure he brought into the photograph. Uh, there's usually people with hats and other circular items in the picture. And he would invariably cut the circle off so that your mind would have to imagine the circle outside the picture. And it actually makes the photograph stronger. The other thing that thing does is it's a well, well, well. Oh, somebody had the microphone on. Nope. Uh, Paul Strand always used a very slightly low camera angle. If you look at the, camera, the height of his button, and so you're looking very slightly up into his face, and it's subtle, but it it's it gives a sense of dignity to the to the subject. It, quite the opposite if you're slightly high looking down at the person. So when I shoot people, I like to get very slightly low, not enough to make it obvious, but it, it does make a, a subtle difference. This one, I like to break the rules, you know, no photos, please. Uh, I don't think they're still after me, but uh, it, was, it makes a great photograph. The markets down there are really, really colorful. And you could, you could spend a day in the markets with all the color that's going on. This, there's a, a bull ring in San, San Miguel de Allende, and this is my uh, ode to Ernest Haas. Ernest Haas was the pioneer color photographer in the 50s and 60s, and he had a, a very famous photograph of a matador and bull, very similar to this. Um, I knew I when I went to the bullfight, I knew I would want to try to get this, and it, it took a long exposure. I had the camera set to about one second, and... I probably took about 30 shots like this, and uh, this one this one was the best. Um, one of the things that, a quote by Gary Winogrand is, I'm attracted to motion. And if, he'd, if he'd see a lot of people moving around, he would head there. He wouldn't see a photograph right off the bat, but he would look for one. And when I'm photographing on the street, I look for places where there's a lot of motion going on. And in San Miguel, there's the main plaza, where there's always a lot of people, but the bus stops are great. This is a bus stop and people get off the bus and there's people, sometimes two buses pull up at the same time and there's people everywhere. And so there's, uh, there's, there's photographs to be made where there's a lot of motion going on. Again, here's a photograph where there's three different scenarios going on. Here's the group of people in the middle that's kind of centered around the infant and the beautiful look on the baby. And there's a woman getting off the bus, looking at the camera then down, what's going on in the bottom left here, the expression and gesture of this woman on the left. So again, there's three things going on and it makes the photograph more interesting. Here's one where um, the gesture of the woman's hand looks like she's pointing right at the little toddler, but she's actually pointing at a violin or something. This is a violin maker and he's selling them on the street. And this is a good example of good compositions make your eye move in a circle and your uh, eye also goes to the bright things first in the photograph. In this case, your eye would probably start at the violins in the bottom right, go up the side, see this hand right here, and then the toddler, and then the finger with the hand, then this girl right here, and then somebody with a 20 peso bill ready to buy something, this face here, right here, and then a little boy down at the bottom, then the shoes on the street, and then here you go again, and you start to circle all over again. They've done, uh, scientific studies of eye movement for uh, pieces of art where a machine could graph the eye movement as it looks at a piece of art. 
and the good compositions, the graph would show a circular, circular pattern to the eye movement and bad compositions would have lines that are just scattered and going all different directions. So when you can make a circular, your eye go in a circle, there's a good chance that the composition is gonna work well. This is early in the morning, the children going to school. I, I love to get out in the rain. Uh, you get the reflections on the street and uh, just a, a fleeting instant. I, I was not looking through the camera at all. I just pointed it and uh, hoped for the best. This is a street festival. Again, I, I like to shoot the audience on the side of the street as opposed to the festival itself. Um, I, I love the, the, the faces, the woman in the top right, then you come down to this little girl, and then the mother with the cell phone and an African-American man behind him, her, and I love the two little boys in the corner. Um, this is a good example of shooting raw. Uh, if you don't, if you shoot JPEGs and not raw, you're gonna miss a lot of information. Inside the restaurant here on the top left, it was almost black in the raw file. But the amount of information in a raw file allow you to bring things up out of the shadows. Uh, and the same goes for, for highlights. If you have a blown highlight on a raw file, you can bring that detail back into the photograph. So if you don't shoot raw, I highly recommend that, that you do it for this reason alone. Here's a street festival again. I love the, the glasses. This is actually a self-portrait in the glasses. Um, everybody loves their picture being taken. Um, I enjoy the difference between the girl right here and the expression on the older lady's face. I saw this group of people and I set up to take a picture and this is like the coffee shop or when you pull up to a, a stop sign and two drivers look at each other. For some reason, she just turned around and looked at me and I got the photograph. This was in a flea market and there's a mirror on that uh, cosmetic thing. And whenever I see a mirror, I try to get somebody in it. So I just framed the, the, framed the photograph and waited for somebody to move into the picture and boom, I had it. Uh, I enjoy the picture right above her too. This was hilarious. I was, he was not there when I was setting up the picture. I just saw these orange electrical conduit pipes or whatever, and I was planning an abstract photograph. And the instant I pressed the shutter, he stuck his head out. <laughs> I laughed, he started laughing. The other workmen around there started laughing. Um, it, it's, you know, if I would have known he was there, I wouldn't have framed the photograph like this. And, uh, the fact that his face is right there in the perfect spot for this photograph, I, I, I can't explain it, but uh, it's one of those mysteries that happen when you shoot a lot. This one was uh, early morning and most likely it's the mother sending her son off to school. And I can imagine her asking him if he's got his lunch money, did he have his books, did he do his homework? I was just hoping somebody would come down the street and left. Uh, and I thought it was important to, to see the face on the wall too. So I caught her right before that. This one, I, I saw the workman working there and I just hung around until something happened. A friend of mine said, this is very Vivian Meyerish because she had done some photographs of glass panes and mirrors on the street like this. I enjoy the reflection inside the glass a lot. And everybody looking away except this man right here. This was a, a really sweet photograph. Um, this is the coffee kiosk in the park where I get coffee every morning and and this young girl was enamored by the man behind the desk there. And you can see it by the expression on her face. And I, I wanted to capture that. And I, I put the camera right here because it was the best composition and I couldn't see her face very well, but I didn't want to move to the left because that would open up the middle. So I just waited until she turned her head, her head just enough and I, and I snapped it right here. And you could see her face and the twinkle in her eyes and her smile and the man's hand in midair ready to cut to grab the coffee and uh he, he never he never changed his expression the whole time i i hope this story turned out well for her this is this was just funny um it's not meant to be irreligious but just funny like uh, don't take life so seriously here this one is uh, like Kit Cartier -Bresson, Bresson said, the decisive moment. This was all about the moment of the, the gravel is in midair being thrown onto the street there. 
And I, I enjoy the angles going on here. I, I tilted the camera. You can see the, the, the building is tilted, but the truck is tilted in the opposite direction. Obviously it's got two wheels up on the curb. And so you've got, you've got the angles going on. The, the building is moving to the left. The truck is moving to the left, to the right. So they balance each other. You got the motion of the two people on the truck. And then I captured this guy on the, on the bottom left with this expression on his face. I took several photographs here. Like I said, a lot of these photographs, you don't get, you don't get these photographs in one exposure. You, you get there, you see the scene, you explore it, you shoot a lot of film, well, not film anymore, but you do a multiple exposures until you, until you know you got it. Here's one, I did not see what she was looking at in the distance, but, but by what her friend is doing to her, I can just imagine it was a boy that she was uh, uh, really liked and her friend is going, come on, come on. Here is the uh, Day of the Dead festivities in Oaxaca, Mexico. The Day of the Dead is a, uh, a festival that goes on for about a week, uh, but the primary days are Halloween, November 1st and November 2nd. And the tradition is that on November 1st, the spirits of the dead come back to visit the living. And um, the families will spend all day in the cemeteries, uh, supposedly communing with the spirits. Uh, on the 1st of, of November, that's the day that the dead children are supposed to come back. And the 2nd of November is the day that the adults come back to visit the world. The, the, the face painting that they do, the origin of, the, origin of, the, of that uh, design is from indigenous shamans who would enter a trance state either by themselves or with hallucinogens. They would enter the spirit world, meet spirits, uh, speak with them, and then come back from the spirit world, come out of the trance, and they would write or paint their what they saw in their visions, and that's what the spirit faces would look like. And so that's that's the source of this imagery that people paint their faces like. This is the same coffee kiosk where I got the coffee with the the young girl. Um, it's just extraordinary what they what they do. Um, she's now she even has contact lenses in to to have a color of in her eyes. This is a good shot uh, at, at, at dusk when you have mixed lighting. Again, it's obvious that I was not looking through the camera. It was down by my thigh and I just pointed it up. And again, if you do that enough, you get, you get pretty good at, at pointing the camera and then the, less, the, the rest is left to chance. But this is mixed light. The uh, street is lit by tungsten light, which is yellowish orange. And when I took the photograph, the camera balanced for the yellow tungsten light, turned it neutral. And the way it does that is, is, is that it adds blue. The blue takes out the orange, but it turns the sky rich blue. So it makes a real interesting uh, play of colors. Uh, you can reverse that by making the, the sky gray and the foreground yellowish orange, but I, but I prefer this version. This is at night, Day of the Dead, and they have uh, professional models that are dressed up ornately like this that walk around that you can have your picture taken. This is an example of, that's not my flash going off. It was mine. I would have blown out the hand and the lady in front of me, but uh, someone else's flash is going off and I just happened to trip the shutter when their flash was on. I, I, guess, I guess it's the flash of that cell phone. I didn't think a cell phone could do that, but you can tell by the light that it's straight on light. But it was just a, it doesn't ever happen very often that you capture somebody else's flash in your exposure. This is night, day of the dead. Uh, just like the Mardi Gras, when the people paint up their faces, they love to be photographed. And generally the, the way I communicate people with people on the street is that I, 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 our eyes connect. I, I smile to them, I point to my camera, then I point to them. And they usually just smile and, and nod yes, and I can take the picture. Um, 15 years ago, I was heavily influenced by the Lord of the Rings movie. The first movie of, there was a scene with Frodo in his hobbit hole with Gandalf. And the huge screen in the theater was filled with Frodo's face, 15 feet tall. The top chopping off through his forehead and the bottom chopping through his, through his chin. And that was such a powerful picture that I, I, I learned to go ahead and crop into faces, get it tight. You don't need to get the whole thing, you know, get in close and get what's really important. And so that's how I, I photograph faces like this. 
And again, I've tilted the camera. If you look at the ar architecture in the distance, it, there's a slight tilt to it and it, it just makes it more interesting. Same thing here. Uh, I'm cropping in close on the faces. The, the camera is tilted. Same thing. Here's the, uh, the cemetery during the day and the, the families gather together. They bring food for a picnic. Um, they have food, they have drinks, they have lots of alcohol and they'll stay all day and sometimes all night long. Um, at night, they bring candles and the entire cemetery is lit by thousands of can candles. It's, uh, it's really a beautiful scene that the place lit with candles. But uh, it, it's not a sad or a somber occasion. People have a wonderful time. You can, you can see the expressions on their faces. Love the little two girls here. And uh, marigolds is the flower of the Day of the Dead and the entire city is filled with marigolds and the cemeteries are filled with flowers too. This family saw my wife and I coming by and they grabbed us by the elbow, sat us down and said, you have to eat with us. And they gave us food, some of which was grasshoppers. We had heard about grasshoppers and we said, what the heck, let's try it. And you know, they were good. Uh, they were fried, they had barbecue flavoring to it. Uh, pure protein, is better for you than popcorn. Uh, they're only about an inch long, but you just have to get past our cultural bias towards that type of a thing. Um, I caught these people singing. Opera is real big in, in Mexico. And these ladies, there's musicians there, and they're singing along with the song. Um, that's all the photographs that I have. But I'd like to, uh, to end with a video that I took of this celebration. Let me get the, the video up here. Here we go. So I took this at the at the cemetery here. <laughs> These musicians there, the man in the hat is so drunk he can hardly stand. These ladies with my wife are telling her about the Mexican culture. I showed this video to an artist friend of mine and she said, I want to be buried there. Thank you everyone for joining me. It was a real pleasure. Have a good night. Oh, Richard, Richard, real quick before yeah. we go. We have some questions for okay, you. Great. All right, so Randy asked, so he said, I noticed many of your shots, um, in many of your shots, the background is at an angle such as a building successful, successfully and interesting. And I wonder how you feel about that as in competition that would um, that would be a deduction for not straightening it. Not all picks, all, not all pictures should be processed for competition bias, but for success. Would you mind explaining your thoughts for making the most appealing and successful picture? Um, I, I think a lot of the photographs look better tilted. Um, I, it, it's a shame that a, a photography judge would have that bias, but I, I think they're wrong. Um, there's a certain looseness, 
looseness to the composition that I enjoy when your, your camera is angled. Plus, if, if the camera is straight, uh, it, it becomes static. I think the photographs, uh, when, when the, the straight, up, straight lines, straight verticals, straight horizontals are straight, it's more of a static composition. As soon as you tilt the camera, that turns into diagonals and the photograph is more interesting. Um, if the judges don't understand that, maybe someday they will. <laughs> Great, thank you. And Susan, uh, she was wondering what kind of point and shoot you use. I have a, a Sony Mark IV. Um, I believe it's 12 megapixels or something like that. And I love it. Uh, my first point and shoot was uh, a Canon 10 megapixels. And, and like I said before, I made an enlargement from it that was as sharp as a four by five inch negative. So at, at 10 or 12 megapixels, you can get great results. Uh, you don't have to spend a lot of money for the highest end. Uh, we have a few more here as well, just so you know. Uh, Michael Daft asks, Rich, when you're shooting um, many photographs at the same location, how do you become invisible? Do people figure out you're there and shooting and ignore you, or do you let your intentions be known? Um, I think that's one of the advantages of using a point and shoot camera or even your cell phone. My first trip to Mexico, I only took my cell phone. And if you have an expensive 35 millimeter camera with a big lens on it, you look like a professional. And I think to people will have a tendency to get defensive quicker, although they never did in Mexico. Um, and when you have a point and shoot, you just look like a tourist. So, yeah. We have a few more, more sorry, let me grab it in the chat. It's been moving because people are so pleased with your presentation. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> giving you kudos. Um, so, sorry, one moment. Uh, so Robert George was wondering um, how your, how your work here um, in street photography informs your architectural photography back home. I guess with the, um, with the Day of the Dead. Um, what I found is when I started doing street photography, it's, it's, a, it's a whole different uh, way of thinking. And it's a, it's a looser, freer type of photography. And that made my large format photography a little bit looser and quicker. Um, Many times I wouldn't try to get people with it. Now I try to get people with a large format camera. Um, so it, it, it cut the, the two influence each other and, and I enjoy that. All right, well, great. Thank you so much. Um, this was great. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, thank you, Richard, of course. That was a thank great very presentation. Much. I enjoyed it. Very fun to see the Day of the Dead celebrations as well. Uh, <laughs> looks like quite a quite a time. Um, but we want to remind everyone you are getting surveys sent to you. Uh, we would appreciate if you fill those out. Um, if you have any suggestions for additional topics for future happy hours, let us know. Uh, we'd love to hear. Uh, and for any future um, workshops or lectures you'd like to attend, make sure to visit us at our education tab on iphf.org. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.